going to bring up your host. His name's Joshua Nauman. He's an award-winning arts and investigative journalism and editor. He was a founding member of the Walrus Magazine, and his writing has also appeared in Toronto Life, Toro, Saturday Night, CBCArts.ca, the National Post, Quill and Choir, and the Globe and Mail. He won Canada's National Mag Magazine Award in 2006 for Arts and Entertainment, and his award-winning book, which I recommend, is Hot Art. It was a bestseller published internationally uh, to great acclaim, including in Vanity Fair and Detours. Please help me welcome to the stage, Josh Nelman. Hi, how is everybody doing tonight? Good. Does anyone here have a cold? Both Heather and I strangely have the same cold, even though she came in from Montreal today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening, um, and such a pleasure to read this book, which I loved. Um, so I hope that everyone here buys a copy and reads it, or takes it out from the library. Heather O'Neill is a novelist, short story writer, and essayist. Her first novel, Lullabies for Little Criminals, One Canada Reads, her second novel, The Girl Who Was Saturday Night, and her third book, Daydreams of Angels, a collection of short stories, were both shortlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. So, with her fourth novel, let's see what happens. <laughs> I'm so pleased to welcome Heather to the stage. So, Heather. Yes, hi. I love this book. And I was explaining to you a little bit earlier, I would take this book out to bars across the city to read it, and I'm a, I sort of like privacy when I read, so I go to a bar and sort of pick a corner and then read for an hour, and I could not get through a session at a bar without twice somebody asking me what I was reading, and I explained to them I was reading the new Heather O'Neill novel, and the first person freaked out. <laughs> She said, I've never heard of that book, but Heather O'Neill is one of my favorite writers. Where did you get it? I said, you can't get this book. <laughs> the second bar was a bar called The Cloak and Dagger on College Street. It's kind of a dingy pub. Maybe some of you know it. I love it there. It's a great place to read. And I was the only person in the bar, except for the bartender. And she was bored and looked at me and said, what are you reading? And she expected a really boring answer. And I said, you know, I'm reading this new Heather O'Neill book, The Lonely Hearts Hotel. And she said, what? <laughs> I've never seen a copy of that book. And I said, you know, it's an ARC. And she said, an ARC? I said, an advanced reading copy. <laughs> and I swear to God, this is what she said to me, which is a line straight out of this book. Who did you have to blow to get a copy of that book? <laughs> I said, you're going to love this book. <laughs> it's full of sex and drugs. <laughs> That's my little introduction. So I could literally, I've been doing PR work for you, Heather, <laughs> and Toronto loves you. So we're so happy that you're here. Oh. So I just want to take the audience into the start of the book. Mm -hmm. um, it starts off in 1914. Yeah. And in fact, it's a story that, in a way, almost never happens. Because both of the main characters um, almost die at birth. Yeah. Um, but instead, they mm -hmm. narrowly escape death and are saved and put into an orphanage. Mm -hmm. The orphanage, though, ends up being a sort of prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if you can talk about the way that you've set up these characters in terms of myth. I mean, they really almost don't make it. Right, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I was kind of looking, I wanted to have the two characters to be um, foundlings and just have no parentage. And so I actually, in looking for their origin tales, I was doing a lot of research into Montreal history at the time. So the first character that we're introduced to, Piero, it starts his mother is, um, she's a very young teenage 
uh, girl who gets pregnant. And she's sent by her parents to the Hôpital de Miséricorde, which is um, in Montreal. It still kind of stands there, but it's abandoned. And it's this massive, um, magnificent and somber looking building. And at the time, um, people from all over Quebec, when a, when a woman was uh, found herself pregnant out of wedlock, she was sent by her family to the Hôpital de Miséricorde, and basically they went in the doors, and the doors were shut. And they were given um, a cloth to wear, and they were given aliases so that no one else within the Hôpital de Miséricorde would know um, who they were. Mm -hmm. And when I was researching, I went to the um, nuns had a museum, and then I was interested in the aliases, and I said, uh, um, can I take a look at the nicknames or whatever you gave them, and then the curator of the museum was kind of reticent about it. And then she said, well, you know, if you're going to go at it at a radical feminist perspective, that's what she said. <laughs> You're going to have a certain reading of the names, but I want you to know that um, the names were completely random and they were kind of done alphabetically, just like hurricanes. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's fine, but I'd like to look at the names. And she's like, again, I'd like to sort of reiterate, if you're um, looking for something, you, you are going to find it, but I, I want you to look at this with open, open eyes. And I was like, bring on the names. And they were all like Humiliation Anna, Salome, um, <laughs> Dismal, wow. and, and things like that. And I was like, these are really pejorative and terrible. Um, so the girl, when she's brought in, I had her in the book named Ignorance. Yes. And it's Iggy for short. So um, she gives birth to Piero, and he's a little boy, and he's stillborn. So he's almost ready to kind of be shipped off in, in his with his little like um, blue body, but then all of a sudden he has an erection and the erection brings him back to life. <laughs> and, and he goes on to be a sort of epic lover. So, um, <laughs> so that was the origin of Piero. And then, um, and Piero was his nickname because he kind of had this um, pale, almost clown-like look. Because also when I was researching orphanages, and um, I had wanted to name him Piero, but I was like, how would it were people naming their children Pierre at that time? So I looked at the names that they had given boys in an orphanage in Quebec, and every single one of them was named Joseph. And I was like, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so in the book, he gets the nickname Piero. So then the next, the heroine, she is, um, her tale, she also, um, it's a young woman on the other side of town who gets pregnant. And then I had read this story, this historical account of there was a woman who was telling young um, unwed mothers that for $50 she would actually take their child. And because adoption was kind of, was, not really part of the Catholic culture. So once you gave birth to a child in the Hôpital de Miséricorde, they would be put in an orphanage for their entire life, and there was no chance of adoption. So this woman was saying, for $50, I will um, be able to take your child and get it at, like a good home in Westmount, and we'll have a wonderful life. So these women were mm. scraping together the money. And then when the springtime came, the babies were found on Mount Royal they had been abandoned in the snow. So with little Rose, her body is found and they think she's frozen to death, but she, a man puts her in his coat and she thaws and comes back to life, but she has these two little red circles on her cheeks that kind of stay there for weeks. And throughout the novel, whenever she gets angry, because she has an interesting, provocative temper, her little, <laughs> the circles like glow. So that is the origin of Piero and Rose. Yes, and she thrives in winter. In fact, she yeah. glows when it's cold out. Yeah, they're, de they're definitely, they're children of the snow. Mm -hmm. So they escape death early, but they, they both end up in this orphanage. Mm -hmm. And of course the orphanage is supposed to care for them. Uh, and in fact, it really does turn out to be um, a very difficult experience for mm -hmm. both of them. 
in different ways. Um, and the nuns, of course, uh, who are supposed to be their caretakers, um, in fact, turn out to be, in one case, serious predators. Um, and there is a nun, Sister Eloise, who takes a keen interest in both kids. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can talk to us about this sister and why she's so interested in Pierre and Rose. Oh, um, well, you're speaking to the darkest corner of the novel, um, mm -hmm. the abuse that... Um, and it happens very early on in the book. It happens early in the book, and with um, the character of Piero, I was... Piero's character, um, he's kind of... He's the most vulnerable and open-hearted character I've ever created. And, um, of course, then I subject him to this horrific abuse, like sexual abuse at the orphanage as a child. And it's a story of a survivor, and I wanted to kind of um, delve into how abuse affects people and their personality and how we kind of recover from that. And because so often with survivors, we're always looking to the traumatic event and trying to find who we were before it to reclaim that identity, and we kind of get obsessed with who we might have been, where we kind of, you can't get past it. Once you've been abused in that way, it changes everything about you and the way you perceive the world and kind of gives you a deep sort of melancholia that's gonna be um, underneath all your actions for the rest of your life, and it's how one comes to accept the fact that you are a survivor and this has changed you into love that self that is the abused self. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's Did I one. Your question? Yes, I mean, that's one aspect mm -hmm. of, of Sister Eloise's relationship with especially Piero. Mm -hmm. You know, she takes a very keen interest in Piero, and at first it's not entirely clear why, but um, it turns out that she's interested in engaging in a sexual relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And in fact, falls in love with him, I think it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. and, at fir and he's quite confused. He's a young boy and doesn't quite understand how to handle the situation. But yeah. at the same time, it's really balanced against his friendship with Rose, who's, who turns out to be this sort of partner in crime. And in fact, they become very close very fast. And in a sense, they fall in love. Yeah, Piero and Rose, um, they fall in love and it becomes a sort of, um, the book is at its heart an epic love tale. And the two of them within this um, orphanage, which, you know, is kind of trying to, to raise the children in a way that makes them adapt to the fact that they're going to be servants for the rest of their lives and sort of inhabit a certain class. Um, they both find <clears throat> that they're incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. Like Piero is a piano prodigy, and when he sits at a piano without um, even, like knowing how to read music or having any instruction, he's able to start tinkering. He starts tinkering with the keys, and he's able to create um, tunes that are sort of exquisite and make everyone feel very sad and and wonderful and dream of these possibilities. So, um, so that's his skill. He's this great um, pianist and Rose is um, this brilliant performer. She's able to do pantomime. She's essentially a sort of clown and um, she can reenact things. So um, the two of them are sent throughout Montreal to perform in rich people's houses. Because that was a story um, my my dad had once told me, because he grew up in the Depression in Montreal, and he said there was times when poor children were sent to rich people's um, living rooms and, and would perform and sing songs for them, and they would be like, oh, bravo, <laughs> how adorable, this poor child is um, straight out of a novel of some sort. But anyway, so they, they do this, and, they, and while they are sort of on this this, this kind of tour of the city, they one day um, come up with this idea for a circus. And 
they kind of map it out on a little piece of paper and it's going to have all these clowns and their most remarkable acts. And when they grow up, they're going to put it on together and become world-renowned performers. But they get separated when they are teenagers and they're both sent off to be servants. So then part of the book becomes, when they become adults, they become intent on finding each other again. So um, this, there's this kind of great humor of the book and uh, theatrical missed, like, missed um, connections, things. One goes in one door and the other one is coming out and all these sorts of fun things of them circling each other, trying to find each other so that they can um, put on this circus. Yes, and in a sense, they're connected by fate early on in mm -hmm. the book. I guess one of the aspects, I, I, I do want to get to the middle part of the book, but mm -hmm. I want to stay in the orphanage for a moment. I'm because trying to get out of it. One, yeah. <laughs> but go on. We're never leaving the orphanage. <laughs> one of the aspects that I think you spent really a lot of time in terms of the writing and getting across is actually their inner lives mm -hmm. as children at this orphanage. And in fact, they are in horrible circumstances. And there's no one really who's watching out for them or protecting them. Certainly none of the adults mm -hmm. are. But they do have this protection, which seems to be their imagination and their creativity. And I wonder if you can talk about the role of this thing, this spark of imagination in these kids that allows them some protection against their circumstances. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the thing, what essentially makes them be able to survive this child is the two of them are artists. They're the two children in the orphanage who are artists and there is something odd about the artistic temperament which allows one to step out of the experience and see it for what it is and not internalize the world but more be interested in chronicling the world and capturing it and commenting on it. So because they have that sort of imaginative analytic ability they're able to see that and know that there is something else outside the orphanage and interestingly because they are orphans it has kind of started them off with the worst sort of narrative possible mm -hmm. but they and especially Rose almost uses it to her advantage because they have they have no idea who their parentage is so they're able to recreate their world from scratch and they're like, well, since we're beginning from scratch, why don't we write our narratives completely on our own? Yes, and they make up stories. Yes, and it's sort of in, and based on, and Piero has a sort of um, haughty demeanor to him, so everyone kind of speculates in the orphanage, like, well, maybe his parents were some very sort of wealthy aristocrats who like, um, or a wealthy girl who got impregnated at a ball or something and abandoned the child because he obviously has these characteristics of um, a sort of very well-bred mm -hmm. person. So and they he just plays go on to that. that. Yeah, he plays to that. And also the two, he's an incredible mimic too, as is Rose. So he only need, when he meets a patron, they're able to pick up on all their mannerisms, so they return to the orphanage, like acting like the haughty people, like in the wealthy people they've met. And, um, and I put some little farcical things in there too, to sort of explain how they can be so um, articulate and wise. Like Rose, for example, has these incredible resources of language. So I was like, well, how on earth would a child at the turn of the century have access to this sort of vocabulary. So I have it, the cook is slipping her um, Russian novels, which she kind of like reads in secret, and then she's able to like all of a sudden like articulate and describe melancholia and talk about um, their experience in the words of sort of like Tolstoy and Chekhov. So I had some fun with that. Yes, and she learns very fast. Yeah, she's and, and that's a pattern throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I think that there's a line actually which talks about the fact that Piero didn't necessarily look or think about the future, but she does. Yeah. Um, so of, of the two sort of partners in crime, 
throughout this book, she's always the one that is looking ahead and planning. Yeah. So they do end up actually both escaping the orphanage at a certain point. In, in a way, it's, it's because the Great Depression hits Montreal and the orphanage is overflowing with new children arriving. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of shipped out in a way. And Piero goes to live with an aristocrat, essentially. Mm -hmm. And Rose becomes a governess. Yeah. But it's quite cruel, Heather. They're in love. Mm -hmm. And then they're separated. Yes. And it's... We have to have drama and conflict. Yes. <laughs> so I tear them apart. Yes. It's a cliffhanger. Yes, because that's, you know, it's... It's true love. True love needs um, to be, you have to struggle to find it <laughs> and to achieve it. So they both end up being sent on these very different journeys mm -hmm. for a time. Um, and in a, in a sense, this is when they come of age. This is when they're, I guess, teenagers in mm -hmm. the early 20s. Yeah. P and Piero goes to live with this aristocrat. Um, and he simply doesn't work. He just won't, he won't actually work a job or mm -hmm. go to school. He just wants to hang around with this aristocrat mm -hmm. and enjoy life and entertain him. Yeah, I mean, that's a sort of actually lovely relationship. Um, it's this very uh, rich patron of the orphanage who's a you know, philanthropist like once a year, but um, he's sort of despised by his entire family because he's been stingy and he's alienated from his children hate him. So he he goes by the orphanage one day and hears Piero playing, so he sort of like um, takes him to live with him and at the orphanage they're like, you really have to um, make sure that this child works because these are children who are gonna have to work for a living. So you have to like sort of prepare them for the world of the lower class and the working class. But essentially for the next like five years, like the old man and Piero just kind of lie in bed and discuss like philosophical <laughs> things and play the piano and wander around. And he, he like um, takes Piero to the tailor and has him fashion this ridiculous suit. And Piero just like pushes him around in the wheelchair and they discuss the great topic. So, um, and then when the, the old man passes away, Piero is left um, again, completely um, useless in the world because he has all these incredibly impractical skills. Like he's a, you know, he's a talented um, musician and he can um, speak to sort of any philosophical concern, but he just cannot work. He's, you know, there are people like that. He's just, um, <laughs> <laughs> so he's out in the world and um, he doesn't know what kind of to do with himself. And I want to get to Rose and what happens to her, but just at, at the end of that section, um, as, as he's finishing up his time with this aristocrat. I think, again, in terms of the darkness, the abuse that happens earlier in the book, mm -hmm. he starts to realize that, I believe there's a line, it's the further he gets away from it in terms of time, mm -hmm. the harder it is for him to deal with what happened to him. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if this five years with the aristocrat erases his experience at the orphanage and being sexually abused. In fact, towards the end of it, it's haunting him. Yeah, he's, um, he is haunted by it. And I think sometimes when something traumatic or terrible happens, when time passes and you realize that you're not getting away from it, then it just accumulates. And you, it, instead of it being your five years away from it, you're five more years with it. And, um, and he's unable to talk about it because also within sort of the context of the world and how we regard gender, it's, there are, um, I mean, gender roles are kind of an interesting, played with interest, I play with them inter in interesting ways in the novel. And um, mm -hmm. it's, there are things that boys are not allowed to talk, talk about or, in the same way that a girl would, and he's, he can't even begin to articulate what happened to him or 
um, in the context of growing up and being a man and how is one, um, how can one be a man in the world when one's been abused by a woman and how do, how do you kind of grapple with that sort of... Um, and he does find a temporary solution, which is... Oh, uh, well, as it's, in... As, as, it's heroin. Is it? Okay, that's where you're going. I was... <laughs> That's, yes, when he's out on the, I mean, he's just abandoned, so he does actually fall into the underworld, and he becomes a drug addict, because he has, um, it's a sort of medicine for sadness, mm -hmm. and so once he is exposed to it, he becomes an addict, and his, I mean, Piero does not have a, a resilient nature, so once he becomes addicted to um, heroin, he's, it's, he's never going to be able he to eat it. He loves it, yes. You know, it, yes, he does, like he's not, he doesn't have the resources within him to ever kick that habit. Mm -hmm. So he has sort of something else haunting him. So at the same time that Piero goes on he's this... He's talking about all the really dark aspects of the book. There's a lot of light and humor and... <laughs> like, not, no one's going to buy it when it's done. They're like... <laughs> What the hell? The thing is, is that the writing <laughs> is so charming and light that I, I found myself distracted by the writing. It's so beautiful that I, I, I really wanted to get at some of... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of the really tough parts of the book. Okay. Well, at the same time that Piero becomes addicted to heroin. And it's also the way you say it, heroin. <laughs> Ro <laughs> Rose goes on a different journey. Guess what happens next, guys? <laughs> heroin. Okay. She goes to a wonderful family where she's a governess, mm -hmm. except for the fact that the head of the family happens to be involved in some interesting extracurricular activities. <clears throat> yes. Um, so the, the man who, whose house she's in is basic, um, he's kind of running the, the underworld in Montreal and owns um, a good chunk of the clubs and many of the brothels and uh, um, yeah, he's, he is kind of the kingpin of the underworld in Montreal. And uh, Rose becomes sort of very attracted to this power. And she sees the possibilities that crime can bring to one. Because at the time it was interesting because it was such an interesting epo like, ep like time for crime and criminals in our history, because mm -hmm. you know, and because um, in and this the was Sin City, this was Montreal. Yeah, so you had Montreal, and then you had like New York, and part of the book is chronicling the, when those two mafias connected, and then that kind of um, criminal syndicate changed the face of North American crime and and how things, how crime was then operated for the rest of the 20th century. So, um, and a lot of the male figures who had became the huge mafia, um, mafioso had come from disenfranchised background and were street kids who went on to become uh, millionaires. So Rose sees this kind of as a possibility and she's very, um, his name is McMahon and she's, um, she becomes attracted to his power and his operation. So then it becomes, she gets very interested in seducing him. And one of that too, that was like a, um, I, in a lot of the, in a lot of parts of the book, I was interested in like flipping gender roles. Mm -hmm. And there are so many novels um, in the English language, you know, from the beginning of one of the first popular novels, Samuel Richardson's Pamela, which are based just on the plot of a master of a house trying to, to um, seduce and rape the servant. And like they'll be running around the house and it's like, don't rape me, don't rape me. And um, you know, this is like at the heart of English literature. So, 
I was like, well, wouldn't it be interesting to have a, a servant girl sort of trying to rape the master of the house? And so she's always trying to seduce him in these, um, and this is a man who's seen it all, but he's never seen anything like Rose. He's quite confounded by Rose, He's actually. completely confused, because mm -hmm. she, um, so I have all these sort of set pieces, like she, her, um, her manner of like disarming him, she'll just, He's just terrified, becomes terrified of running into her in the hallway. Because <laughs> she'll just be there with her dark hair and she's like holding like milk and she's like, if you give me a dollar, I'll put this on the ground and lick it like I was a cat. And he's just like, or she has, you're disturbing. Or one time he sees her and she just turns and like, she's just like kissing the wall. And he's like, I don't know what to make of this girl. Or there's a scene when she's, she's walking down the hall with, I think a book on her head. And he asks her why she has a book on her head. And she, she refuses to acknowledge that she has a book on her head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she's just doing all these things that um, are, gra she's gradually making him so fascinated by her. Mm -hmm. Because his opinion of women is that women are just beneath him. And here is this girl with this sort of um, inexplicable intelligence and a, um, a deep awareness of the power of sexuality, and he's becoming falling under her spell. Now he um, he is a drug dealer, but he's also a pimp. He runs brothels. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, she, and there's very funny parts and, too. <laughs> and Rose, as she seduces him, mm -hmm. I think sees a real opportunity for advancement. Exactly. She, what she wants, she wants in. Yes. On, in the underworld. And also, because she had been, her childhood dream was working in entertainment, and she knows, she sees like all the clubs. Because Montreal at that time became a mecca, first of entertainment. There were so many clubs, and every North American act passed through. Prohibition wasn't in Montreal, so so many Americans came up, and all the American. Um, gangsters and everybody came to Montreal because it had just such an incredible nightlife and um, so that's and it also had the other side of being completely corrupt like Montreal was lawless like every cop and the mayor everybody was paid off and the criminals were running the city but she, she's also interested just she knows this underworld because she had been she is by heart an entertainer and she knows um, this would be something she would excel in. So she kind of has the idea that she might also be part of this world and could run clubs. And um, so that's part of her relationship with McMahon, but there's just no way he's ever going to let her near that stuff. Yes, and it's quite complex because he thinks for a moment that he suddenly has a mistress. But in fact, when she becomes his mistress, she starts to really ask him detailed questions about how his business is run. Mm -hmm. And in fact, starts to attend meetings with his colleagues. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting relationship. It's um, because it's a power struggle from the beginning. It's this, and, it, and for me, that was kind of an interesting juxtaposition where you have um, this uh, really powerful, mafia guy and this 17 year old girl and they are just like they meet and they get locked in one of these kind of um you know sometimes you get relationships that are basically you're out to destroy each other and you know it but and you think it's love but really you're out to kill each other i've never been so I've never they're been mortal in enemies they're mortal enemies but they mistake it for love it's it's psychological. As sometimes we do, you know, you think you're in love with someone and you're like, oh, no, we're actually mortal enemies. <laughs> it's psychological warfare. It, it totally is. So, <laughs> the, yeah, they're always, um, they're always out for one another. And it becomes sort of, um, at one point in the, in the book, Piero accuses, he's like, you hate McMahon more than you love me. Mm -hmm. Well, and actually... It's during this point in the story where McMahon becomes aware that she has this attachment to this young man mm -hmm. who plays piano in the city at a club and is also aware that they're having a hard time reconnecting. And it's his, 
it's his mission to, I guess, keep them separated. But even he isn't powerful enough to do that. Sure, everybody in the novel is trying to um, keep Rose and Piero apart because everyone wants, like, Piero and Rose sort of for themselves. And, I mean, they're very lovable characters, the two of them. Everyone who meets kind of um, falls, falls, in falls in love with them. So everybody is interested in them not being, not finding the, the love of their life and the kind of having this, the relationship that the two of them want. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in terms of the research that you did for writing a novel during this period in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Your other books have taken place in the Montreal that you know. Mm -hmm. This is a different Montreal. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to learn about this Montreal? Okay, yeah, because um, my first two novels, they're both set in that same red light district in more contemporary times. And for this one, this is almost the prequel of the neighborhood as opposed to a prequel of um, some characters and it details the origin of the red light district in Montreal and its heyday and um, my original interest in it was um, actually from my father I was raised by my dad and um, he had grown up during that time and he used to always tell me stories about living in um, the 1930s in that area and he was a kid and he would um, he worked for criminals and like he would like climb into windows for them and he had all these like wonderful magical bedtime tales about gangsters <laughs> and robbing banks and uh, you know like guys who had gunned down for 25 years and, and like so these were your... These were my bedtime tales mm -hmm. and they were so wonderful to me and I'd be like tell me the one about um, your, you know, your friend who, who uh, robbed the suit store or something like that, and then he would <laughs> tell me, and, and then he would just animate it. And, and in my head, it just had this carnivalesque time, and I was always like, like anything, when you always, like when you're a kid, you idealize your, um, the era that your parent grew up in. Like my daughter's always like, oh, the 80s, how magical. <laughs> um, so... For me, it was always like, oh, the 30s, how wonderful. Everyone was like paupers and trying to murder each other. So lovely. And um, so I had this idea of recreate, like having a novel that was set during that time and kind of had the feeling that I had towards it as a child. So that's why it has a very um, fairy tale like quality to it. And um, so I did tons of research into the area at the time. and. Um, Someone made uh, a map that I looked at, and it was a map of the red light district, and it had on it like all the sort of exits that you could get out of, like if the, if a place was raided, was raided, how you could get out a back door, and which alley you would go down, and which like door you could knock on that would let you pass through, and then where um, there were secret doors to get into little gambling houses, and it was just this. It looked almost like a theatrical set, hmm. so. Um, the book, in a sense, is a kind of commedia dell'arte. It's set. It's like a, it's a story of clowns, essentially, who are performing. And so I made the red light district seem like a theatrical set where there are trap doors and you can be on a different level and people can be having soliloquies at the same time. Like there's one scene where two people are on opposite sides of the city and they're but they're having a dialogue because you kind of can you can have that within um, a theatrical setting I see yeah that's actually when Piero and Rose are about to reconnect I think yeah they're searching for each other they're searching for each other and then they're they're kind of in then I it's almost like a split screen mm -hmm. kind of scene so each is doing one sentence like it was kind of tricky I wasn't sure it was going to work um, if one could do a split, like the cinematic technique, but within um, a text. But then I was quite pleased when I was done. Sometimes as a writer, you're like, ooh. Um, so. I thought it worked too. It was really charming. <laughs> but I mean, that's an epic point in the book when they mm -hmm. do reconnect because they've been through so much, but they both come to a realization that they're lonely. Mm -hmm. And obviously this goes to, it's, it's a state of mind in the book 
the Lonely Hearts Hotel. I mean, they're both on these separate journeys. And Rose, of course, is already, I think, has an idea that she wants to get involved in organized crime in order to be an entertainer. But it's so important that they meet again. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of, they kind of fall into, as young adults, such corruption um, and criminal activities that almost also the search for each other becomes the search for their innocence. And they almost need to find each other again so they can kind of reclaim um, this, this sense of childlike morality that they once both had. So they're looking for each other, but they're also looking for um, their selves or their souls. And they figure, like, when they find each other, they can sort of create a new world and, like, a good world as opposed to sort of the, like, strange evil that they're falling into. I swear it's, there's funniness in the book. <laughs> but I think I'd, I'd actually like to end this interview by just asking you in terms of... Mm -hmm. The role of creativity in these orphans' lives is so important. I, I'm curious in terms of your own journey as an artist. Mm -hmm. Did creativity help save you? Yeah, of course. Um, it was, I mean, I came from a really uh, lower class background and my parents were a mess. So, and, and it was like, and I felt what the world expected from me was so little, and that statistically my chances of doing anything in the world were so small. But I didn't care because I had this like dream that I was just gonna, um, I was going to write novels. And it seems so sort of preposterous in context, but um, it, it was, and it was sort of, that was um, the one thing that kind of led me out of that world was just following the path of writing. And I was like, if I just continue writing, then somehow it will lead me to a different place. And I wasn't sure where. And weirdly enough, it led you to the reference library yep. in February mm -hmm. in front of this audience. A round of applause for Heather O'Neill, please. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Um, I know that you probably have questions of your own. So there's a microphone in the center aisle there. And I know that some of you are shy. It always takes a few minutes for people to get up there. Yes? Yep. Do you? We, I think we, we grow up because of our parents and in spite of our parents. Mm -hmm. You obviously had a very interesting childhood. And your characters have had a very interesting childhood. So I wonder if you'd like to comment on that in spite of because of role of our parents. I'll just repeat it so everyone can hear um, and, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but characters with an interesting childhood inspired potentially by your own childhood, is it because of or in spite of? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, that's always a difficult question. And I think, I mean, one of the ideas in the book is the idea that children don't belong to their parents. And I think that becoming a happy person and achieving one's sort of fulfillment in life involves seeing oneself outside of one's context and deciding who that person is. And um, so in a lot of ways, I find most incredible things happen in spite of one's parents. But I'm biased, you know? I have like, um, I don't even believe in like, um, cause I remember in high school we read like Brave New World and it was a dystopia and I was like, how? This is so utopian. It's so wonderful. <laughs> like you don't, you get created in a lab and you have no parents. Like how amazing would that be? <laughs> So um, I have sort of, uh, and that's why I like orphans too. I don't even like, like, I find biological um, ties are overrated. <laughs> but I know I'm alone in that because whenever like I've had a drink and I'm like, wouldn't it be great if like we just could abandon this whole idea of family and 
People are like, no. And then I'm like, siblings, how disgusting. <laughs> and, and everyone's like, no, I like my siblings. They're lovely. And we have Christmas dinner, and I'm like, ah. That's not my cup of tea. I think we should all run away at nine years old and go out into the world and discover ourselves.